Hello, and I'm so pleased to be with you again. I have such great memories to my visit to Guatemala in December 2018 when we launched the PISA D in school assessment results. And I remember your national report, one of the most inspiring ways to present outcomes from PISA to the community. Uh, unfortunately, this time I can only join you by video because of the pandemic. But it's a great privilege to join uh, you for this even more important report on the out-of-school assessment. I would really like to commend uh, Minister Claudia Ruste Estrada and the entire team at the ministry for the remarkable achievement, not just to complete the in-school assessment, but to be among six pioneering countries to also assess students who are not enrolled in school. This is a very courageous undertaking. It's not just technically difficult, but more importantly, it's politically courageous to put the most marginalized young people, those who are not in school, on the map. Uh, in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we had 1.5 billion students locked out from their schools. Out of school learning became sort of the lifeline for education everywhere. But in the developing countries, this has an entirely different dimension. Even before COVID, 61 million children of lower secondary school age were out of school and often entirely off the radar screen of public policy. They don't feature in any statistics. We don't see them, not to speak of tests and assessments. And that's why the OECD and Guatemala and four other countries work together to find ways to include them, to assess their skills, and to learn about the issues which those young people face and what might bring them back to school. And this is why the team in Guatemala, you can see in this picture, worked so hard to identify and locate those young people and then to collect data from them regarding their skills. Why are we interested in measuring skills? Here are some of the results about the rewards of having higher levels of skills from the OECD's assessment of adult competencies. The first thing we found is that what people know and what they can do with what they know has a major impact on their life chances. You can see that the highly skilled adults are twice as likely to be employed and almost three times more likely to earn an above median salary than poorly skilled adults. Poor skills severely limit people's access to better paying and more rewarding jobs. Highly skilled people are also more likely to volunteer and they see themselves as actors rather than objects of political processes. People with better skills are even more likely to trust others. So trust isn't just about how you were brought up or about the people with whom you live. It closely relates to your skills. And that tells us that what we can do, that we can do something about trust by giving people the tools, the skills. And that's important because without trust in public institutions, public support for ambitious and innovative policies is always hard to mobilize. And particularly where we ask people to make short-term sacrifices for long-term benefits, like in this pandemic. So in the end, fairness, integrity, productivity, inclusiveness and public policy all hinge on the skills of citizens. We can see the impact of higher levels of skills at the country level as well. You can see an almost straight line connecting the test scores of countries and the economic growth they see. So that brings me to PISA, measuring those kinds of skills. And what distinguishes PISA from many other assessments is that it's not primarily concerned with whether people can simply reproduce what they have learned. PISA looks at whether young people can extrapolate from what they know and apply their knowledge creatively in novel situations. And that's so important today because, you know, the world no longer rewards people just for what they know. Now, Google knows everything. The world increasingly rewards people for what they can do with what they know. And then PISA combines that information with a lot of contextual data from the students, from the schools, from the teachers and from the parents to understand what we could do to help students learn better, to help teachers teach better in schools to become more effective. 
PISA is done every three years and the focus of PISA shifts. We started with reading, then the focus shifted to uh, mathematics then to science and then we turned back to reading. But in every, every cycle, we also include other aspects. The capacity of young people to solve complex problems. Their capacity to think creatively. The capacity to look at issues through different lenses and perspectives, to appreciate different ways of thinking, be open to different cultures. No? Their well-being, all of those aspects are very, very central to PISA as well. And it's also the fastest growing international assessment. PISA 2018 was uh, covering 80 countries and the next round in 2022 is going to be over 100. No? So more and more countries are joining the effort to learn from and with each other by comparing their learning outcomes. How do countries in the world perform comparatively? What are the international trends in education policy? What can we learn from the most rapidly improving education systems? Those are key questions that countries work together to address. The PISA sample for the in-school assessment, uh, no, which we launched in 2018, is 15-year-olds in grade 7 and above. Now, that's the reference population for the in-school population. And for the out-of-school test that we're launching today, it's also a national representative sample of 15, 14 to 16-year-olds no, who are out of school or who are in school but in grade 6 or below because that would not be covered by the PISA target population. The framework that we used for the assessment is similar in the in-school assessment and the out-school assessment. We build an assessment and we look at the outcomes, the cognitive outcomes, the social, the emotional outcomes, the well-being of students in relation to the resources in education and how well they are utilized. The support that young people achieve to attain in their families, the quality of educational processes, the time that is being invested in learning and the inclusiveness of public policies. That is the kind of conceptual framework that underpins the assessment and helps us make sense out of those kinds of results. Now, how is PISA D different from PISA? It's actually similar in its approach, but it has some important differences. It first provides a more granular definition of student performance at the lower end of the PISA scales, giving us a better understanding of what it is that students who struggle in schooling can and cannot do. It also captures a wider range of social and economic contexts because we found that students, particularly when they're not in school, may be under very, very different social and economic circumstances than those who are in school. Uh, and then it builds capacity in the participating countries for managing and using the results of large-scale assessment. It's not just about collecting data. It's about how do you transform educational data into meaningful advice for public policy. PISA RD is also used to monitor achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, UNESCO is using that for measuring achievement of the SDG4 target now. And this is how the assessment works. Now, it starts with an interview of young people and then it gives them a core module, a start from an assessment. And then when students do not are not able to read a simple statement, then we're looking at the components of reading. Why do they struggle? Is it because of vocabulary? Is it about fluency? What are the barriers for students not being able to read? We call them reading components, the elements of reading. Because often when we see, you know, students dropping out, they can't read. We need to better understand how we could help those students to get back on track. So those reading components are the way to measure this. And then students who were successful, they are getting then a lot more items and tasks where they can demonstrate their capabilities. And then we survey also the students, the, the people around them, you know, the persons most knowledgeable about the respondents, parents, for example, who could tell us a little bit about, you know, what that, those students. And this is the result of Guatemala on the in-school assessment compared, compared to other countries in reading. You have GDP per capita, the wealth of the country on the horizontal axis. 
And now you could sort of ask yourself, well, if Guatemala would have as much national income as the other countries, on average, you know, how would it turn out? And you can actually project the results. You can see, yes, Guatemala would do a lot better if it would be a wealthier country. But you can still still some way away from the line. There's still some room to grow, even, you know, conditional on national income. Guatemala could be doing better. And when you look at this in more detailed ways, here you can see the performance of schools on the vertical axis mapped against their social and economic context on the horizontal axis. Now on the left side, you can see schools in more difficult social and economic conditions and on the right side, schools in wealthy areas. And you can see that, yes, performance of schools is quite closely related to the socioeconomic countries. You can also see that private schools marked by the darker dots are more to the right side, you know, wealthier parents preferring to send their children to private schools. But actually, we don't see much of a performance difference between public and private schools once you account for social background. That's an important finding. Public schools actually conditional on the social context do as well as private schools. When you ask yourself, you know, what does it mean at the performance? You can see schools in the dark red uh, area are just a few, fortunately. Their students can you know, just decode and understand some very short sentences, like the red car has a flat tire. You know, students can read that. At level 1b, where you can see actually a fair number of schools, students can understand short texts. They can find a single piece of explicitly stated information. Now, what color is the red car? Students can give you the answer to this. Now, when you get closer to the baseline level, level 1A, there is a lot of schools in Guatemala. Students can identify the main theme of the author's intent in a text about a topic that is familiar to them. And then you get to the baseline level where students can read and understand simple text. They can connect pieces of information, draw inferences beyond what is explicitly stated. Now, that is the foundation for the further development of skills. And that's also what, you know, in SDG 4 of the Sustainable Development Goals would be, you know, considered baseline performance. And then you have students doing better in this. A few schools actually doing better than that. So you can see, yes, some schools in Guatemala are ready for the sustainable development goals, but a lot of schools have still quite some way to go, like in other countries. And what's interesting, you know, when you zoom in into schools in similar social and economic contexts here, you know, these are schools in slight disadvantage, you can see a lot of variability among them. You know? And again, both, you know, public and private schools. These are schools that are similar, we call them statistical neighbors. They have a similar kind of family context, uh, similar kind of rural urban environment, and a lot of variability in school performance. That makes it so interesting for public policy. Now, what you can see here is basically uh, some schools could learn a lot from schools that are quite similar to them. No? Connecting those schools, no? finding ways, you know, to build learning experiences, to share results across schools. It's one of the most powerful levers to raise education performance. No? Countries like Vietnam, you know, that used to be among the lowest performing countries and have that have so remarkably improved their educational outcomes, have always connected, you know, the better performing schools with the less well performing schools. They try to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms. And you can see there's a lot that Guatemalan schools could learn from Guatemalan schools, not just from other countries. And you can see the same thing among wealthier areas. Now, once again, you know, you can see variability in the performance of schools that are in quite well suited kind of economic environments. And now you can actually map Guatemala's performance uh, uh, with other PISA-D countries and also the OECD average. Now, uh, this is in the case of mathematics. So once again, you can see uh, there is a share of, uh, of, of students um, uh, doing quite well and uh, but a long trail of schools of students that could be doing better. No? And uh, you can do the same thing now, mapping uh, Guatemala against the world, no? all other countries. No? This is how Guatemala's in-school assessment results in reading compare with all the countries in PISA 2015. No? And you know, while you had have now got used to this long trail of low performing students, the red kind of segment, you can see there are some other countries that have managed actually to move 
uh, all students not just into the yellow but in the green area number one singapore no? in the 1950s 60s singapore's performance would have looked quite similar to what we see in guatemala and the same is true in vietnam and parts of china no? but they have you know worked hard they have built a first class education system that has then you know become the locomotive of education edu uh, economic performance no? difficult but impossible but, but but possible now let's look at the out of school results of course that's the main point of our discussion today when it comes to attainment and exclusion uh, the pisa d countries show quite different pictures but guatemala is closest to the pisa d average now with most of the out of school use having dropped out of school during or at least at the end of primary school but it's also important to note that many young people in Guatemala are participating in primary school as a result of great repetition or joining late. Now. So whether they were held back because they didn't join school in time or because they repeated grades. Now. If you look at the different zones, now zone one never enrolled in, uh, in, in school, zone two, students who dropped out of primary, zone three, grade six or below no. zone four students who left primary education zone five secondary dropout zone six students who fade out who sort of gradually uh, withdraw from school and then zone seven these are the students in school now you can see actually guatemala has a lot of students in school but you can see also some of the zones particularly zone four now, <clears throat> remember, students leaving primary school actually quite significant. Grade repetition affects only 11% of 15-year-olds in OECD countries, but in the PISA D countries, it affects over one-third of the in-school students and almost all of the dropouts. Think about this. In fact, grade repetition in primary grades is the strongest predictor of low performance and dropout by the age of 15. It's an expensive policy that doesn't improve student achievement and fails to keep students in school, affecting their attainment levels. No. It doesn't help students if we push them you know, to the next year. It helps them if we build a supportive environment that actually sustains them and nourishes them and ensures that they catch up. No. It's also, you know, uh, from the teacher's perspective, it's very convenient for teachers just to let students do the same thing again with the next teacher. But, you know, it's not the right incentives. If we give teachers more resources, better resources to actually support struggling students in advance to detect when they are at the risk of fading out, if they have the right economic and social support, we can achieve much more and in fact at lower expense. But you can also see on this chart, in all of the PISA D countries, the students enrolled in school out of outperformed the out school use in reading. Now, that's not a surprise. They had more chances to read in school. Uh, while almost 30% of Guatemala's in-school students perform at level 2 or above, it's only 0.4% of the out-of-school youth who perform at that level. No? And when we take into account this out-of-school population, the percentage of 15-year-olds in Guatemala that perform at level 2 or above is reduced to a little over 14%. And that compares to an OECD average of over 76%. We see a slightly worse picture in mathematics, and that's true for all countries. Uh, with for Guatemala, the percentage of 15-year-olds performing at or above level 2 being reduced to a little over 5%. When we go deeper into the results, we see a lot of variation in performance across the seven zones in reading among the out of school. No. The highest performances being from the secondary school dropouts and the lowest from those who never enrolled, no, quite intuitively. Now, zone one, remember, are the ones never enrolled. Zone two are the primary dropouts. Zone three, the grade six or below. Zone four, the primary leavers. Zone five, the secondary dropouts. And zone six, fading out. And seven, the ones in school. That's perhaps what you would have expected. When it comes to mathematics, we see little difference between those who have never enrolled in school and those that dropped out during primary education. Isn't that interesting? So there must have been some ways in which those out of school 
actually um, <clears throat> who never enrolled yeah uh, keep learning mathematics you know maybe because you know they help their parents they f they figure things out no? but there is a wider variation depending on how much schooling the respondent has and of course the in school students perform much higher than the out of school stu uh, children across all of the zones now again not surprising an important finding is that there was a much wider variation in performance in reading between the quarters of socioeconomic status among the out-of-school youth population than among the in-school students. Now, in other words, the students out of school were much more different in terms of their social background than the students in school who were a more homogeneous population. Now, the youth in the highest quarter outperformed the youth in the lowest quarter by a very wide margin, as you can see here. Now. One explanation for this might be language no? since a high proportion about 30 percent of the out-of-school young people reported that they do not speak the language of instruction at home no? but when you look at mathematics you can see the opposite picture the, the variation in mathematics performance across socioeconomic quarters was larger in the in-school population than in the out-school population no? maybe because mathematics is a more school-bound subject no? that is something that you learn in school much less so in another environment. 70% of the out-of-school youth in Guatemala reported that they are satisfied with their lives and in good health, which is similar to the average of the other PISA D countries. But it's a much lower proportion than in the in-school students. And it's quite worrying that almost 10%, one out of 10 of the out-of-school youth reported that they are not satisfi satisfied with life and in poor health and a further 22 said that they are not satisfied with life and good health. These are higher proportions than for the in-school students who were generally satisfied with life and in good health. There you can really see how the kind of social conditions are a main barrier for being in school. It's well established that poverty often pushes children to work. No? And basically here you can see the shares of students that were occupied with a number of activities. Now, did you look after young children? Did you take care of one or more sick family members or relatives? Did you cook a family meal? Did you do house cleaning? Did you wash clothes? Did you fetch water? Did you do the family grocery shopping? Did you look after elderly adults? Did you work in the family garden? Did you shop or collect firewood? Did you take care of livestock? Did you help with the family business without pay? No, those were the activities. You can see actually these bars are quite long also for you know Guatemala. No? Uh, we know that when children leave school early to enter the labor force, they typically are more likely to end up in occupations that limit their chances. No? The chances of breaking out of poverty. All of the out-of-school youth in PISA D countries are involved in some labor activity, as you can see. But only a third of them are in paid employment, mostly boys. No? You can see here how the labor activities of girls tend to be caregiving and domestic chores while the boys are working in business or on the family farm or garden. When it comes to reasons for attend not, not ending uh, school, uh, sickness is the most common and girls were more affected by this than boys in all of the countries. There were also issues related to the need to work and help out at home. But the supply of education was also a barrier with transportation being quite a big issue as well as the lack of a teacher. No? Look at the categories. No? I was sick. I was not doing well at school. I had to take care of a family member. I had to take care of a sick parent or relative. I had to help with work at home. I did not have a teacher. I could not reach a school due to transportation problems. I could not understand the language of the lessons. Teachers or students were on strike. I had to bring money home. I was no longer interested in school. I had to help with seasonal work on a family land. All non -sig uh, quite significant numbers now. And you can see how they vary between girls and boys. 
PZID also asked the parents of the out-of-school youth about reasons for not at attending school. No. Look at the categories. Inability to enroll in school because of gender discrimination. No. Caring for his or her children. Caring for parents or other relatives. The distance that he or she would need to travel to school. Not having enough money. Lack of motivation for further studies. No. Believing that school will not pay off in the long run. Not, not seeing the horizon of this, not the kind of long-term benefits from this. Parents relocating for work, not knowing what he or she wants to do later on. Fear of violence in the school. Poor grades. Wanting to start money in a full-time job. And it's quite concerning to note that a significant share in all countries reported that discrimination against girls and Roman was a factor. No? And in Guatemala, more than in any of the other countries, not having enough money to go to school was reported as the main reason for non-attendance. No? You can see here, the, bars is, the bar is longest. In addition, for boys especially, having low grades and wanting to start earning money were other important reasons for abandoning schools. No? Across the Pisa D countries, almost 75% of out-of-school respondents said that they walked to school when they had attended. No. Distance from school is a significant barrier for about one quarter of the out-of-school young people in Guatemala. And that's obviously predominantly a rural issue. No. And when they had attended school, the out-of-school youth in Guatemala had a journey to school of around half an hour on average. And you can see here the various means of transportation that they used. The wider learning environment is, of course, also vitally important for achieving good education outcomes, especially when it comes to family support. The PISA D out of school assessment asked the youth about their engagements with their parents on educational, but also cultural, political, social issues. And as you can see here, important differences were observed in Guatemala and Panama also when it came to eating the main meal with parents and proficiency in reading and mathematics. And these differences were observed in all of the countries, but the correlation in Guatemala was strongest. You can see it's a whole of society enterprise. The role of parents, the environment at home is a very, very important factor to engage young people in learning, to help them see the value in schooling education. And then perhaps most importantly, PISA D asked the young people also about resources and processes that would help them to return to school. Now look at the categories here. <clears throat> you can see the percentage of students who said that returning to school would be a matter of better quality of teaching, now. help improving reading skills, a vocational school, a vocational program, a school to learn at my own pace, a safer school, a school more accepting of students' differences, no school fees, a school, a school closer to home, financial incentives, a school accessible to students with disabilities, support for the students' children while attending school, and no discrimination. No? Taking together, this is the feedback that can help countries to develop a more coherent response to the challenges of ensuring that all of the 14 to 16 year olds are enrolled in school and actually remain there until they complete their studies. In particular, most of the out of school young people in these countries who were surveyed cited, as you can see here, better teaching, a focus on developing basic reading skills in the early grades more diverse offerings amongst secondary programs, provision of financial incentives and investment in infrastructure and education resources as key to making it possible for them to return to school. Of course, you know, Guatemala is not alone in having a lot of out-of-school 15-year-olds. As you can see here, we have many even experienced and some wealthy PISA participants whose education systems cover barely 70% of their young people. Guatemala's 
bold and commendable effort to include the out-of-school young people in the PISA D assessment is really one of the most courageous things you can do to put the most marginalized young people on the map. No? And you can see the reasons, you know, why they dropped out and also some of the factors that might, might bring them back. No? I hope that Guatemala will make good use out of this data to design more inclusive education policies in the future. And more importantly, that your leadership, your example will be followed by some of the other countries that you can see on the right side of the chart that are not yet assessing the out of school students. No. So once again, my congratulations to Guatemala on your extraordinary achievement, your commitment over many years to participate in the world's most demanding and comprehensive international assessment, in particular, your leadership in assessing the out-of-school young people to bring the most marginalized uh, young people back into the picture so that public policy can help them to achieve their goals. I look forward to a continuing our collaboration with Guatemala in PISA 2022 and in other education activities that we may develop together. Thank you again. Gracias.